Hey everyone, welcome to part two of an interview that I started last week with David Smith. If you haven't been able to listen to that, please do that first. You get a sense of who David is. He shares his testimony as someone who came from initially a church environment into a drug-infested environment and then found his way back to Christ. It's an amazing testimony. Today we're going to talk about what happened to David after he came to Christ and the ministry that the Lord led him into uh, to do today. And his ministry, I believe, has great impact on you as a pastor, you as a church leader, because we need to understand ways that we can reach people during this COVID crisis. Many of us have lost our ways and lost our way in terms of evangelism, and I think that this is a really a viable way that we can find our way back into that uh, that lifestyle and help train people in our ministry to do the same. So stay tuned. The interview comes up right after the intro, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Thanks. January of 2001, uh, they offered me the position of executive director over at Pivot Ministries in Bridgeport, Welcome Connecticut. Welcome to Ministers and Toolbox, that's what providing really leaders started, with the tools they uh, need my, to succeed in ministry. Now, Bridgeport. here's your really host, Casey Sabella. That uh, area of the east side of Bridgeport, which Pivot Ministry uh, resides. So uh, that's kind of brought me uh, to Pivot. And um, how, long brought me you the, how long were you the director at Pivot? Uh, I was the director of Pivot for 12 years. Okay. And um, I, I, I was there 12 years. The Lord blessed us. It, it just grew. It was just incredible, uh, the, gr uh, the, the growth of Pivot and the programs that we started and uh, the people, the men that were saved. And uh, we started Pivot, uh, uh, Pivot Wise, and we started Alumni System for Wise. We started a greenhouse, a, a CDC, a, a Community Development Corporation, to train men and, and, and them working and entry-level jobs such as um, landscaping and uh, uh, construction and uh, and because we were looking for another uh, revenue flow to help the ministry and uh, we started that uh, it was just incredible how the Lord uh, blessed that area and in that time that era so it, it was a blessed time so now that came to a close in mm -hmm. sounds like 2012 Mm -hmm. And you felt like the Lord was moving you on, and um, not too long after that, a door opened for you to minister and spend a couple of years at the Bowery mm -hmm. in New York City? Yes. And um, again, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Bowery, there is a ministry that goes back a lot of years, mm -hmm. and uh, you served as director there for four years? Yes. Yeah, uh, and the Bowery mission is... Um, uh, a rescue mission. It's the it, it's the third oldest rescue mission in the United States. It's the fifth largest rescue mission in the United States, um, and uh, I think it goes back 128 or 130 years. Um, and I was the director of uh, compassionate care and men's ministries, and um, the Lord really blessed me there. Yeah, and it was it was for about four years. The the mission grew. Um, uh, God uh, really taught me uh, that was the biggest uh, error in my life uh, that I learned so much about ministry uh, and I learned so much um, not so much about the things that I was anointed to do uh, to serve uh, the least of these and people such as myself I think that's inherited in me I think that is something that uh, is natural runs is a natural thing with me because uh, that's my biggest uh, calling that the Lord has given me evangel evangelizing the least of these uh, but I, I learned so much about administration I learned so much about how to run a huge ministry uh, so much about uh, having relationships with people outside of of, of my my venue uh, it was just a, a time of learning and also also a lot of stress it was a, it was a big job and uh, the Bowery mission the time I was there grew uh, tremendously and I had a lot of responsibilities yeah the Bowery mission itself I mean for people to kind of get a sense is a multi <clears throat> excuse me multi-million dollar operation mm -hmm. um, because it requires multi millions of dollars to make it operate mm -hmm. there's just that many people reached between buildings and everything else it's it's not a uh, it's not a tiny <laughs> tiny thing 
because it's mm-hmm. been around so long. So, well, uh, a lot of things happened before I left the Bowery. Um, my wife and I started a, a ministry, and in, in, in this is restoring life through Christ. We started a ministry. We seen the need uh, that 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 year and a half or so after leaving Pivot and going to the Bowery. I uh, there was a time that I was searching. Uh, my wife and I were searching, Lord, what are we supposed to do? We knew we were supposed to leave Pivot. We knew it was time. It wasn't that I, I was pushed out. It, we just heard from the Lord it was time. And so we started this ministry, Restoring Life Through Christ. And uh, we, we started the ministry with an after-school program. We moved from Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh, we own a house out in Waterbury, and then we moved right into uh, Bridgeport, right into that, uh, that f- at the time was a 14-block radius, and we lived among the people for about a year and a half, too, before I went to the Bowery. And then the first six months, we started uh, kind of taking a census of what they needed, what was going on in the neighborhood, starting the relationships and so forth and so on. And one of the biggest things that were needed was an after-school program because the kids came home after school and the parents were still working. Uh, If they came from a a two-parent household, uh, both of them were working. If they came from a one-parent household, which most of them did, because now we're working in inner city and our population is black and Hispanic, uh, and, um, and these kids were by themselves after school. And uh, they were just left to their own devices. Uh, and, and most of them weren't watching TV. Like when we were kids, we, were, uh, we went home and watched the cartoons. But these kids were out and doing different things uh, at a young age. So we, we started an after-school program what was greatly successful. And that's what we did. We just, the beginning of uh, Restoring Life Through Christ was just uh, focused on the after school program, making sure these kids came home, did their homework, ministering the gospel to them uh, in small bites, not overwhelming them uh, with the gospel, and then getting their families or their parents involved. Uh, through that, my uh, wife became an advocate at the schools and uh, the ministry grew. And then um, whenever I was at the Bowery, I got the job at the Bowery. So the uh, first six months, my, I would come home on the weekend and uh, my wife was still uh, there in Bridgeport and until our, our lease for our apartment ran out. So uh, the overlap uh, when we started rest- uh, Restoring Life Through Christ to the Bowery was about a six-month overlap uh, okay. when we were in New York. So right now... Um... <clears throat> In terms of the ministry that you have, you're you're basically going alongside people that are in the inner city. You've got a, a ministry. Uh, we'll have the information certainly up on the website uh, on our show notes page, um, Restoring Life Through Christ. Mm-hmm. dot org. And um, ministries Restoring Life Through Christ Ministries dot org. Okay. And um, essentially, right now, what you're really looking to do is connect with people that are in the city of Bridgeport in a twenty block radius. Mm-hmm. and um, ministering to those needs at the very base level. A lot of times churches are looking for, and I know pastors are looking for, ways to reach, especially in this COVID-19 crisis situation right now, pastors are looking for ways to reach people. And um, the conventional ways of reaching people just aren't working. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, people are a lot of people aren't even coming out of their houses, uh, much less coming to your church. And even if you can reach them online, it's really difficult to go from A to Z in, a, in an online relationship, it just doesn't happen. So your ministry is really focusing on finding out where these people are. You've already been, you, you know, you understand that lifestyle. You've been kind of leading people. So your initial contact with them isn't necessarily giving them a track and saying Jesus loves you per se. Absolutely. Is finding out what their particular need is, walking alongside them, seeing what you can do to help and minister to that need. Um, your desire, as we've been talking about it before the show, your desire is to connect with churches, in, in this case, particularly in the Bridgeport area, and let them uh, partner with you in this whole process. Uh, you uh, certainly need financial support to do this. They have the benefit of um, helping train people in their churches to work alongside with you and reach some of these people. Uh, you're not looking to necessarily build a church as much as you want to. Mm-hmm. If, if you do see these people get saved through this experience, you want to have partners and churches that you can bring them to that say, listen, Let's help them, you know, continue in their walk with Christ as you go back to the dynamic of really finding these people, helping them, and ministering to them. So 
I see your ministry, or at least my perception, and you can tell me if it's right or wrong, is really a bridge between a person who is completely lost and finding their way into a church. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to think about a bridge, a couple of things, uh, Casey, the thing about the bridge, it goes both ways, right? right? We lead them into the church. And one of the biggest things we want to do with this ministry is bring the church to the community. Right. And, and, and so, so it's, it's, it's a, a two ways. Absolutely. That's a, a, a brilliant um, analogy of what we want to do. Uh, and the, we thing wanna... is, the thing is here, Dave, and this is what I've seen, you know, being in pastoral ministry for several decades myself, is we often have people in our churches and their only gift is sitting in the pew. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're really not, you know, I mean, Ephesians 4 says that our major job as a, as a pastor is to train people for the work of ministry. Well, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean they just simply become Sunday school teachers or we send them off to Bible school to become pastors? Yeah. Or do we put them in real-time ministry? So this, this becomes, in a potential partnership, this becomes a real training ground for them mm -hmm. to really reach people in a in a, in a real-time way. And, and I honestly have to say, I mean, and we've talked about this off camera, but I mean, a lot of parachurch ministries or ministries like that seem to be more in competition with the church than in mm -hmm. partnership. And many of these parachurch ministries are kind of a thing of, we know how to do this, and your churches aren't reaching anybody, so we're going to do it for you. And that's never been God's heart. Mm -hmm. uh, the church is the church. It's God's love. And this is a, a parachurch organization that really finds a way to partner with churches is gold. Because mm -hmm. to be frank with you, I mean, a lot of pastors are, they don't know how to train people to do this kind of work. And they would appreciate a partnership like this to really say, okay, we've got 5, 10, 15 people that have been sitting in our pews for the last 10, 20 years, and we really want them to grow more in their faith and develop more, and at the same time reach people for Christ. So this could be a really unique partnership. Absolutely. And, and, and through the different programs that we have, uh, it's it's an easy transition. It's it's not as, uh, some, you know, those people that you're talking about sitting in the pews, uh, they, they might have um, uh, some legitimate concerns about ministering and going out uh, outside the walls of the church. So we have some programs to help like one one program we have is meet the needs uh my wife and i we we have these relationships now we're concentrating on about 12 families now about their needs we've we've uh we've cultivated these relationships over the years we know these people they allow us into their house right so we go into their house we talk with them we see what they physically need one of the things about ministering the gospel and a long-term effects is first take care of the needs you know you can't you can't uh minister the gospel ev evangelize the gospel and somebody is hungry or they don't they don't have clothes you know what i mean well, They're it's, not like james, it's like yeah. james said you know it's it's like james said you know you can't say to somebody be warmed and filled and be blessed <laughs> and, and they just don't see it so that's part of it so now we go into the houses and uh and they they fill out a form and and uh they tell us what they need mm -hmm. they tell us what i what they need and we and one of the things i was telling you casey is that with this program that we have and it's called meet the needs with this program it is a ten dollar registration fee one of the things that we want to do with the people that we serve is we want to make sure that they always have some skin in the game. We want to give them a hand up, not a hand out. So it's not, it's just not a soup line where you just come and get some. Now you, there's a registration fee. You have to go through this process. And now they, there's a list of things that they need. And what we do is we take those lists to the community, uh, the churches in our community, Fairfield County, uh, whatever the case may be. And and any person that wants to give something on that list, they have an opportunity to either drop it off to us or they have an opportunity to go with us to deliver that uh, item to uh, that family and to be able to be introduced to that family. Um, and, and that's an easier way uh, to kind of uh, start um, – uh, galvanizing some of these relationships and taking the fear out of uh, going outside of the church. Does that Fantastic. make sense? Yeah, it really does. 
Dave, um, we're way out of time, but um, okay. I want to thank you for uh, being a part of this today. And uh, for those of you who are listening, either by video or by audio, we'll have certainly more information on the uh, website at ministerstoolbox.com. Uh, you can visit his website, and I'll have, again, a link at uh, ministerstoolbox.com for you to connect with Dave. And if you're in the Bridgeport area, of course, a uh, great way to connect. Um, and uh, begin to think about, if you're not in the Bridgeport area, begin to think about how you might partner with ministries outside of the church and create some partnerships because we're the body of Christ. We're not mm -hmm. kind of, we're not designed, you know, one, there's not one specific church that's designed to reach one specific city. And uh, that mentality, I, fr I frankly think, needs to die. Uh, we need to start recognizing that the body of Christ is a lot of members and we need to start seeing each other as, um, as partners rather than competitors. So thank you once again for being a part of today's ministry, and uh, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Casey. Appreciate it. I just want to thank Dave for being part of our show these last two weeks, and uh, I hope that you caught some of the vision that he has for reaching people who are seemingly unreachable by society standards. There are ways that we as leaders can partner with other ministries in our cities and other outreaches in our cities in a way that can be mutually beneficial. If the church begins to think of itself not as an island, but as part of an entire community, when churches begin to join together and see the strengths in other churches or other ministries and begin not to be competing with each other, but helping each other, we can accomplish a great deal in our region. Well, as you know, I end each podcast with a quote, especially for you. And this one comes from Ernest Hemingway, of all people. Ernest Hemingway, as a writer, was known for his succinct writing. In fact, a lot of people would get aggravated with him because he didn't seem to fill in the blanks enough. His contemporary was F. Scott Fitzgerald, who did the exact opposite when he wrote. But Ernest Hemingway some, said something which I think is going to take a little thinking on our part to understand. He said these words, Never confuse motion with action. A lot of churches confuse motion with really making a difference or action. Until next time. For more resources, go to ministerstoolbox.com. Thanks for listening.